Mark's lesson is on God's Word. So as we sing tonight, hopefully these songs will be in tune with what he is going to bring us. Wonderful. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this another day you've given us to worship you. We beg forgiveness for any sins we may have committed, things we've left undone. We pray that you'd forgive us, that you might hear this prayer. We thank you, Lord, for 
loving us so much that you would send your only begotten Son, Lord Jesus, to be a sacrifice to save us. We thank you, Lord, for the love and the grace and the mercy that you have extended to all of us. And for all mankind, if they would but hear, believe, and obey. But we thank you, Lord, that we are here, brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray, God, that you would help our congregation to grow spiritually. Help us to dig deeper in your word each day. To search the meaning of all those words that we might plant your wishes in our heart, develop an attitude of subservience to you, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are sick in the congregation, that you would heal them and make them well. Some with ongoing illnesses that have been lasting for a long time. We pray for those who are undergoing surgery, Lord, that you would watch over them and enable the physicians to do all the things that they need. And we thank you for those who have had surgeries recently and they're healing and doing much better. And we pray, God, that you just continue to bless them. Bless all of us in this congregation. and Give us the desire to love you, Lord, to love each other. Please help us to have the desire to be an example to other people. We pray, Lord, for your mercy on our nation. We have people in power now who have corrupted the divine government that you gave us. You instructed us in, in your word to obey the government but our government, just like some men, they have turned away from you. They have abandoned you. We pray, God, you give us the, the good sense to follow the right things, that we might maintain civil law and be able to live as we have in the past. We pray, Lord, that you give us a strength, <clears throat> the strength and the attitude of upholding your word at every turn that we will not recognize the things that please the world, search for the things that please you. We pray, God, that you have mercy on the children in this nation that are these people are trying to corrupt. And we pray that you give all of us, especially in your church, the ability to rightly divide your word and bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of that word. Please give them the strength to, to face the future when we are gone. We thank you again, Lord, for the blessings you have given us in this congregation for our material blessings, but most of all, for our spiritual blessings. Help us to grow in, in our love for you. Help us to always be thankful for you, Lord Jesus, and your, thank, and your sacrifice. We pray this prayer in your most holy name. Amen. Cheers, my 
How precious is the book divine? You know, is the Bible precious to you? You know, if I were to ask for a show of hands of who has Bibles in their homes, probably everyone here would say, you know, I have one, two, a dozen, however many. You know, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, see one of us and we'll be glad to get you a copy of one. But, you know, most of us are blessed with multiple copies of, of the Scripture um, in different forms, whether it's in, in book form, paper form. You can get it on your phone in an app. You can get online. And the wonderful thing about that is you can, you can search very quickly and find the Scriptures that you're looking for or certain ideas or concepts in the Scripture. You can get it lined up very quickly, and it can help in your study. But to be able to open up the pages of God's Word is, is a great blessing, and it's a, it's a great opportunity for us. Don't take it for granted. Many people have despised God's words and God's commands. Go back to the Garden of Eden when, when the serpent tempted Adam and Eve. God had given his word, he'd given his commands to Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the day they ate of it, they'd die. And, of course, Satan didn't respect that. He said, oh, go ahead and eat. You won't die. You'll be wise like God. He took... And twisted what God had said. He did not respect God nor the, the word of God. And as a result, Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sin, sin entered into the world. And with a lot of consequences entering the world as well. well. We've all done that at some time in our life. But hopefully, ultimately, we respect God's word. The psalmist in Psalm 138, beginning in verse 1. Talking about the word of God and God himself. He says, I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praise to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. There at the end of verse two, he said, you have magnified your word above all your name. Kind of an unusual wording there, but if you really look back at what is being said, the ESV, for instance, says, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. I mean, he's not belittling the name of God and saying the word of God's above the name of God. No, all he is saying there, the psalmist is saying, you, God, have exalted above all things your name and your word. Do we exalt the name of God? Do we exalt the word of God? Do we realize it is, as we say, it is the word of God. It's God's word. It's, it's inspired by God. The psalmist in Psalm 119 said, How can a man cleanse his way? How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. It's important. Young and old alike, it's important to take heed to the word of God. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate upon your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Is that our, is that our attitude toward the word of God? Realizing the power of God's word to lead us in the right way, to lead us to the cleansing that's found in the blood of Christ, to listen to the, the warnings that are given there in the scripture, the promises that are there as well. Do we want to learn and be taught the precepts, the statutes of God? Because God has magnified his word and his name above all else. God's word is important. If we believe in God, we need to believe what God has said to us. If we believe in the word of God, we need to believe that it is, as we stated, God's word. You know, you think about the value of the word of God. How precious is the book divine? Why? Because it's by inspiration given. But to many people, they've tried to destroy it. Satan tried it in the Garden of Eden, really, to get Adam and Eve to question the commands and the word of God. You look uh, at different times throughout history where people have tried to destroy the word of God. In the first century when those apostles were out preaching and teaching the gospel and they were writing down the, the New Testament and, and getting that, um, that out, in, into, um, out into the world, people tried to destroy them and destroy it as well. But God's word has endured. In fact, as you look at those New Testament writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude, you look at what they suffered because of the fact that they were a Christian, some of them apostles, they were the writers of the New Testament. When you look at what they suffered, 
it's amazing what they were willing to do. I mean, if you look at the price that was paid by those Bible writers, in this instance, that really the New Testament writers were looking at in particular, you could do the same with the Old Testament writers. Matthew was said to have died in Ethiopia. Now, we don't have on all of these everything and inspiration that shows us what happened to them, but you have to go through um, what they call church history or secular history, and, and you can begin to, to see the stories about how they met their demise. Matthew was said in Ethiopia to be either staked to the ground or perhaps impaled to the ground, and then he was beheaded on top of it. Mark died in Alexandria. They tied a rope around his neck, and they drug him until he died. You know, brutal deaths. You look at Luke. They hung him from an olive tree until he died, according to history. It, you look at John. We know from the book of Revelation that he was there in exile on the Isle of Patmos. But it's said that he was arrested in Ephesus. That, According to tradition, he was thrown in boiling oil that, uh, if the miraculous means, did not kill him. And then he was sent to Patmos with slave labor and ultimately um, died perhaps a natural death after that. You look at Paul, the Apostle Paul. I mean, you look at the scriptures and it ends with him. The time of my departure is at hand. But as you look at the time that he lived and who would have been emperor at that time, uh, most likely beheaded by Nero, Emperor Nero. Peter, he was crucified, but he didn't think he deserved to be crucified like Jesus. And so he was hung upside down and died on the cross. James was said to be thrown from the temple and then beaten to death on top of that. Jude was killed with an axe along with Simon in Syria. I mean, you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, Jude, the, the writers of the New Testament through inspiration. But you look at how people stamped them out, stomped them out, ended their lives upon this earth, but they didn't take away their eternal life that was offered to them. But you look at the word that they, through inspiration, penned for us. You look at the Old and New Testament scriptures. 1 Peter 1 says, all flesh is a grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. I mean, people die. They, they are born, they live, they die. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. The word that we have today that's preached to us, that we study, that we read, the word of the Lord endures forever. You come down through the centuries and you look at God's word being taught. Paul could say you know, it was taught to the whole world back in the first century. But as it continued on, people rebelled against it and many people departed from it. Those, those that claimed to be religious people, many of them as well um, believed or taught false doctrine and things kind of grew um, away from what God's word said. In fact, it got so much so that the, the Catholic Church at that time, which was you know, the, the power um, to be within the religious world um, in general, they decided that people did not need to have God's word. I mean, let the priest tell you what the scriptures mean or what the scriptures say. Don't have it in the common vernacular. Keep it in a language that most people do not know or can't understand, or at least make it where it's chained to the pulpit, literally and cannot be accessed because they realize that if people could access it, they'd see that there's some abuse going on, there's false doctrine that's being taught. And so they did what they could to stomp out the word of God. And you look at some of these Bible translators. You know, we're not gonna talk about all their religious beliefs and such, but here are certain men that were trying their best to get the scriptures written in a language that the common people could read, trying to make it accessible to you and to me, to the people of their day, so the common people could open up the scripture and see for themselves, here's what God's word says. Here's what it doesn't say. To be sure they were living right, being taught the truth as well. You look at people like John Wycliffe. He died in 1384. They burned him at the stake, which is a terrible way to die. And I was reading something about, you know, talking about the ones that were burned at the stake, and they say, well, some, um, some are saying it's only bad to begin with, but once the nerves are all burned, you don't feel anything anymore. I thought, well, that's still terrible, you know. I mean, it's a terrible way to die. Uh, to be burned at the stake, but that wasn't enough. Fifty years later, the, the, the Pope that was in power at that time had his body dug up, and the bones that remained, they burned them again and scattered them in a river, and he made the comment, well, the Archbishop Bishop made a comment, talking about the, the translation that Wycliffe had been a part of, the pearl of the gospel is scattered abroad and trodden underfoot by swine, you know. I mean, get goodbye and good riddance. And, so, you know, again, they burned him, they killed him, they dug it up, burned again, and spread the ashes. 
You look at William Tyndall, he died in 1536. I mean, you're coming down over 100 years later. They strangled him. They burned him at the stake. And all he was trying to do is to translate the Bible into the language of the people. And they looked at him as heretics for doing such. But he was quoted as saying, if God spare my life, ere many years I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. He told the religious, religious authorities, if you can just get the language in the, I mean, the Bible and the language of the people, they'll know more than you know of the scripture. In other words, they'll know the truth. You look at John Rogers, he, he was killed in 1555. Um, he wrote under a pseudonym. Um, he, it's Matthew's Bible, it's called. Um, but he was burned at the stake. And the queen had him burned at the stake because she said he was a heretic. And not only did he help with the translating of the Bible, he, he had realized that you know, the, the doctrine of transubstantiation, where th they would teach that if, when you take of the bread, eat of the bread, drink of the juice um, for the Lord's Supper, it literally turns into the blood and body of Jesus, they would teach. And he, he taught, no, it doesn't literally turn into the body and blood. It's representative of the body and blood of Jesus. It doesn't literally change into it. And, and he, they said, hey, if you'll, if you'll renounce that, we'll let you live. But he would not renounce it nor the fact of translating the scripture as well, he would not renounce it. And so they burned him at the stake. Um, Pope, Pope Paul V in 1606 said, do you not know that so much reading of scripture ruins the Catholic religion? And we're not just picking on one religious group. I mean, you can look at anyone that teaches something different than God's word. If people open up the scripture for themselves and read what the word of God says, it will shine the light on error, on false doctrine, on false religions as well. And, and that's what th this Pope was saying. Look, if we let people see for themselves what the scriptures say, they'll see that we're not living by the scripture, we're not teaching the scripture. And so they tried to keep the scripture from the people, doing what they could to stomp out, to stamp out the word of God. But God's word has been and will continue to be magnified, to be worthy, if you will, of praise. During the, starting in really 1560, and going up all the way to 1966, there was a list of prohibited books among the Catholic Church. And many of them were, were some, well, some of the books that were on that list we might agree with on certain things as far as false doctrine would be concerned. But what's interesting to me is that many editions of the Bible were on that list as well. They said if they're written by a heretic or an unbeliever, what they would consider a heretic or an unbeliever was, would be people that did not agree with what the Catholic Church at the time was teaching. And so they, they literally would have book burnings, including certain copies of the scripture as well. They did not want the scripture in the common language. They didn't want it in the language of the people. And many Bibles were burned during that time. Now, by the 60s, it wasn't the Bibles on the list, but there still were many. And finally, they did away with the list of prohibited books. Now, we live in an age where um, you know school systems and libraries are having lists of prohibited books. And it's, not the ones that really need to be prohibited, but some that are trying to teach the truth of, of things as far as morals are concerned, or as far as God is concerned as well. And so you look at the price that was paid, and we could, we could go with a long list of people who were put to death for their religious beliefs, for people who are simply trying to get back to what God's word said, some did a better job than others, but trying to provide the scripture for the common people. And they lost their lives. But you go back to 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, oh, Man is like a flower. The grass withers and the flower falls away. These people died and are gone. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you, preached to me. You know, we can look at other examples as well. But why does God's word endure? What is the glory of the word of God? Why is God's word magnified and to be magnified and to be, to be uh, submitted to? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, look, all scripture." All scripture from beginning to end, from Genesis 1, 1, the very first verse of the Bible, all the way to the last verse of Revelation chapter 22, it is all the inspired word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed. I was listening to, um, I was listening to radio the other day, I got to pay attention to a, a country song that I really hadn't paid attention to, and I don't remember what the song, who the artist was, just is talking about God inspiring people. And it's talking about different songs and, and basically how this writer of this song was inspired by God, how this writer was inspired by God, and, and talking about you know, the Bible in the same way. That 
basically God inspires all of these singers that are singing to sing like they do. And God inspired those writers of the Bible to write as they did. No, there's a difference. There's one thing to be inspired by somebody. I can say, boy, your example inspires me. You know, it motivates me. It encourages me. It helps me to be a better person. That's one type of inspiration. But when we say all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, it's not where God just made someone motivated to write down their thoughts and beliefs. It is God breathed. God told those writers what to write. They were led by the Holy Spirit um, to write the things that they wrote. Jesus said, our, the Holy Spirit will remind you of what I've done and said. It will guide you into all truth. And we have that completed truth, the word of God, in the pages of our Bible today. He said, when you look at God's word, it's given by God. It's profitable for our doctrine. Where does doctrine come from? It's not what the church says or some church leader says. It's not what the preacher stands up and says. Hopefully what I'm preaching is true, but we don't base doctrine on what the preacher said or the church said. Our doctrine comes in the pages of God's word. You know, thus saith the Lord. What the Bible tells us, here's what to do to be saved. And guess what? We do what the Bible says to do to, do, do to be saved. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so we believe what the scriptures say. That, he, that the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Son of God came to earth, a light shining in darkness. We believe that Jesus died and rose again the third day. We believe that we have to submit to God's will in order to be saved. To not only believe, but to obey God's word. To put our Lord on in baptism. The doctrinal things as far as why do we worship like we do? Why do we teach the things that we do as far as salvation about the church? It's not because that's what I think or you think or I feel or you feel or what we voted in or voted out. Our doctrine comes from the pages of God's word. We are to magnify the word of God. We are to follow what it says. There are things that we need to be reproved or corrected about. We live in a world that accepts anything and everything and we're supposed to reach out to the world and accept anything and everything. No, there's certain things. We reach out to the whole world, sure. But we're to call people out of sin into righteousness. There are things that have to be reproved, things that have to be corrected. There, there's a right way to live. There is a right. There is a wrong. There's truth. There's instruction in righteousness. There is a Christian life to live. And he says, when you look at the pages of God's word, it gives us what we need to be complete, to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's word. You go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, we read just a moment ago. And let's get the context of that. Go back a few verses. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 22. See, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. You purify your souls by obeying the truth. God's word is truth. And so as we obey God's word, our souls are purified. He said, you've been born again. Not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible. We are studying about the fruit of the Spirit on Wednesday nights. So we've been talking about the concept of sowing and reaping. And he said, look, the Word of God, the seed of the Word is sown into your heart and to the hearts and lives of others. And, and when it takes root, you're born it, 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 and you act upon it, you're born again. It's not corruptible, but incorruptible seed. And in case you miss it, he says, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. God's Word endures the power of the Word. The authority of the word. Because all flesh, uh, flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. Yeah, the grass withers, the flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. The value of the word of God. You know, we, we look at these people who gave their lives when they were writers of the scripture, when they were simply trying to, to live according to God's word, trying to be... Um, children of God, when they were simply trying to preach the gospel to others, when they through inspiration were writing the pages of the scripture and then teaching that to others, many did not respect that and, they lost, um, and as a result they lost their lives. You look at those translators that were trying to get it into the common language and the price that they paid for it. Do we take it for granted or do we truly appreciate it, not just because of those lives that were given but ultimately because of what it is, the word of God. The psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. 
The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God's word, God's commands, God's law, the Bible is perfect, is sure, is right, is pure, is clean, is true, and is righteous. What's our attitude toward the word of God? It says, it's more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. You know, what would be something that you'd want above all else? If, I, if you could just think of anything you'd like to have, what would you want? Well, to some people, what's that gold? You know, they want as much gold or money as they can get. To you, it might be something far more valuable or maybe far simpler than gold. Maybe it's some of the things that, that money can buy. Um, maybe it's certain relationships that we have or friendships that we have. You think about what's the most important to you. And it says, when you come to God's Word, when it comes to the Bible, you should desire it more than you desire whatever that item was or that thing was that you placed in there of what you would want above all else. God's Word, desiring it, is sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. What's your favorite food? You might say, we had to get it down to categories. Are you talking about breakfast, lunch, and supper? Are you talking about a meal? Are you talking about one item? Are you talking about a dessert? You know, what are you talking about? And we can think about things that, that oh, that's so wonderful, that's so great. You know, your favorite dessert, and you can picture that in your mind. And how much you'd like to have that. And then you say, now that you put that in my mind, I, I want to go home and have that now. You know, you may want that bowl of ice cream or whatever it may be. But he says, when it comes to God's word, it's sweeter than honey. And the honeycomb, whatever you can think of that, that sounds delicious and wonderful, we should desire God's word in that way in really a greater way. The value of the word of God. The lives that were given, providing it to us. The lives that were given, um, continuing it on. But ultimately, the value of the word is, is the word of God. It's given by inspiration. It's God's word to us, his revelation to us. Do we want to know who God is? Why, where we came from? Why we're here? Where we're going? Go back to the word of God. If we want the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? Go back to the word of God. One closing thought, I was looking at an article the other day where this um, spacecraft came back to Earth that, I mean, uh, um, some samples from an asteroid, I think it was an asteroid um, that came back to Earth and they were saying, you know, it's the first pure sample they've gotten because they did all these protections to get it back in its purity. And they said, maybe we can get some answers to where our solar system came from. And I thought, just how foolish. You know, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools because God's word provides the answer to, to where we came from and to why we're here and to what we're headed toward as well. Realize the value of the word. Pick up God's word. Read it daily. Study it. Take it to heart. Plant it within your heart and your life. And then go out and live it. If you're not a child of God tonight, I want you to do what God's word says to do in order to be saved. Believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith. Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. As a child of God, are you walking in the light of God's word? If you need to at this time respond in any way, we encourage you. We invite you. The Lord extends his invitation. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing?
had the opportunity to take of the Lord's Supper that would like to do so at this time? Is there anyone that would like to give to the work of the church at this time?